Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome marketers, advertisers, and those who love them to Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, decisions, politics, and choices that go with being the head of marketing at any company in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former Chief Marketing Officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here with my guest, Jeff Culleton. Jeff is actually the president of the Adcom Group, located in beautiful Cleveland, Ohio, where we are actually shooting this session. Jeff, I think you should tell us a bit about yourself and the Adcom Group before we begin. So first of all, the flattery that I feel right now to be included in something that dons <laughs> you is uh, is on a biblical level. So uh, Adcom is, I, I love, uh, this is, I think everything you've done with the show has been really cool so far. So Adcom is, uh, like you said, it's based out of Cleveland. Uh, it, it has been based here. It's 32 years old. Um, we've been doing, it's roughly 120, 130 person agency, full service. Um, it was just a really neat client roster in healthcare, financial services, uh, transportation. Uh, and then we, you know, we do some fun stuff. We do craft beer and, uh, school supplies and, you know, some kind of random stuff out there. So it's, it, it's the kind of agency, um, where, you know, we, we, we fly a little under the radar, uh, uh, we're private and we're not a part of one of the holding companies, but we, we, I lovingly refer to us as a SEAL Team 6, where we, you know, we are just built to do some really, really amazing creative strategic work. So I've been the president here. Uh, I've, I've been with the organization for seven years. I've been the president for the last three. Uh, before I was uh, with uh, Adcom, I was part of the startup community. Uh, which was both amazing and extraordinarily taxing at the same time. So, you know, I just, it's what an unbelievable home to find. And it allows me to interact with people like you. Nice. Well, thank you. And what's not to like about school supplies and craft beer being in the same place? Um, I mean, if you don't, if you don't think that combo goes together, then I don't want to hang with you. So, so here we go. Today's topic, how to manage an agency bake-off without crushing the soul of the agencies involved. And Jeff is in a unique position to see this, but here's the setup, everyone. Companies often decide they need a new front end for their go-to-marketing efforts. And that involves putting out a thing called a request for a proposal or RFP to a small group of agencies and then letting them compete for the business over a specified time period in what is almost always a winner-take-all contest. So there's gonna be a lot more losers than winners. Jeff is an RFP veteran, having been through this as both a lead agency and a specialized agency. And so, Jeff, talk us through what happens when a bake-off is announced uh, when, when you're at the agency. T tell me what, what, what goes on. It's the most masochistic bake-off possible, <laughs> first and foremost. But, the you know, so, you know, when to, to start from the beginning, you know, agencies, typically there's one of two ways to kind of look at this is we're only going to go after stuff we're hyper focused in or we're going to go after everything we're going to we're going to uh, uh, take all the opportunities we can uh, but what really happens once you decide to say yes to being engaged uh, in an RFP is kind of like a, a huge amassing of forces so what we're doing functionally is we're putting together a, a hyper skilled team in order to look at a brand through a keyhole make some assumptions based off of the data that they're providing us, any of the brand and competitive work that they're providing us, and then some sort of North Star guiding light of what they're looking to change. You know, hey, we're looking to grow our audience in X, or we're looking to be more impactful with Y. We're looking to take more market share from so-and-so. Uh, we would like your thinking on how to do that. And so what we'll do is, you know, we bring together kind of our, you know, our, our hit squad of people who are really good at thinking uh, abstract about these problems. And I use abstract purposely because, you know, a lot of day-to-day -day work after uh, it, uh, work's been brought in is linear, do this, get this out. This is really a, hey, I have minimal visibility to who you are as a brand. 
I am going to take some flyers and put some work in front of you uh, that hopefully resonates with you. And how long do you have for these usually? Well, I think that's one of the things that you know, it, it kind of g- denotes a good RFP from a bad RFP in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, let's hear it. Because uh, we're going to go down the path now of yeah, best well, practices and then Hall of Fame worst practices lineup. And we're, we're going to talk about both of them. So start with the best practice here. Yeah, so I think I think really clearly defined and stuck to timelines with an RFP for a you know, significant piece of work and AOR for creative or media or something to that effect. You're probably looking somewhere between 60 and 90 days. Um, there's going to be a lot of interaction between not only your group, but the groups, uh, presumptively, if you move through the process. Uh, and then there are, which we see too many of, is extraordinarily short timelined RFPs or on the maybe even the worst side of it, RFPs without a timeline. And we know we need to do something, but we have nothing driving our decision. Um, so a good wow. RFP and yeah. That's like crazy. Experience. Well, but yeah, I think you would be shocked how frequently it happens where an RFP is being driven by a want and not a need. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of creates some nebulous, very movable uh, deadlines. And so, you know, when we look at, I think, really good RFPs where you're able to not only intake what a company is looking to do, where they're really sharing under NDA good intel with you so you can make um, educated strategy, you know, you're looking 60 to 90 days is, in a lot of cases, uh, quite a sprint, especially if you're looking at an RFP that's going to be, if that's going to be multiple rounds. Um, you know, we'll get people like, ah, oh, we just want a big idea. And you're like, oh, you would you would actually just like us to amass our people together, uh, okay. give you a big idea, and then you can go dark for a while. It's a it's an interesting combination. So so how, how, like, let's say we have a 60 day timeline or a 90 day timeline and you're going to come to round one. When is round one kind of done? And then what's the best practice for ending round one and then managing the agencies that don't win? So, oh, that's, God, is that a good question? So, you know, I think when when RFPs are executed, people, brands specifically can do themselves huge favors by choosing selection gateposts that are round specific. Uh, and I don't think this, I think an RFP, you know, we want to get somebody who's going to push us and has experience in this and that. Um, but, you know, when we see an RFP that's got six or eight groups in it. Um, really great RFPs tend to have a, okay, this is what's going to call down that group to two or three. Give me a live example. Give me a live example yeah. of call down criteria. So call down criteria would be somebody who is, uh, is bringing us an idea with executions in channels that we aren't currently using that uses our voice, but expands it into an audience that we aren't currently touching. And, but knowing that that might not be the idea that gets picked, but we want to know that you have the horsepower and the latitude to not only think it up, but to, to be the person or be, to be the group that's going to put something together where we go, okay, they may have missed the mark on this and this, but man, that, what, whatever that nugget was, is something that we feel really good about. And we'd love to, to move that into expanding upon that thinking. So, so then you get called out or you you make it to the next round. When you get called out, what is the yeah. best way to let down the agency when you when you don't make the cut? Because usually I'll tell you, what, like four or five players in this or sure. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll start with what typically happens, which is the don't do, which we see all the time. When okay, you we're don't in the make of fame, it the Hall of Fame worst practices line up. Worst, Here we go. We're starting in the Hall of Fame. Um, so what happens ninety-nine times out of a hundred is whoever calls you, hopefully they call you and they don't email you, although that happens frequently. And they they say the same thing to you. Ah, you know, you know, this that you you came in second. You're great, but you were I gotta tell you a little you almost wish that at a certain point people could swipe left or right and just, you know, make it a mercy killing versus somebody trying to give you um some sort of you know backhanded compliment while still saying you suck. Um but what (laughs) what really what really I've seen happen in a handful of times, um, which I think is extraordinarily useful, is the organization who is running the RFP taking the time to say, hey, 
here's the reasons that we chose not to go with you. We didn't see a through line of your strategy um, from the creative to the media to the execution. Uh, we didn't think that your team had the ability to perform this way you know, repeatedly. We thought that the copy really felt flat here and our leadership feels strongly that copy carries the day and the very concrete examples of so, why. So this is like honesty in talking to the agency and who's delivering uh, this? Is this a CMO delivering this or this? Who who would you have call you? So I think in, in a perfect world, the CMO does it. I think it, it doesn't, it often gets delegated down. But I also think it's a really good training mechanism for people in on the brand side yeah. of learning how to give that kind of feedback because they have to give that to themselves, their internal teams, their internal agencies at some point as well, being able to be critical and but do it in a way where not only is that person going to receive it, receive it appropriately, that but then possibly use it as a multiplier moving forward in the next RFP is something that's extremely useful in their own internal organization. And so yeah, typically, I think we would see a VP of marketing, a director of marketing, depending on who's involved in the RFP, get sent to do the bad news giving, not surprisingly. Yeah. But, you know, CMOs, uh, you know, CMOs who are really training up people to take their place. That's that's an area you see where people have done it really well, where there's nuance in the training, where they go, hey, there's going to be conflict in everything we do. This is just another thing that's conflict is going to happen. You can't practice conflict and avoidance. You need to, to hit it because in the 30 seconds of discomfort after that, now you can lay down that conflict. You don't have to handle it anymore. And you've also given something to the group moving forward that you're not working with. So, the, so, so you lose the bid or you lose the yeah. RFP. How, how does the team take it? And what's the best, like, cause a lot of these sometimes, you know, the agency needs this for. There we go. They, yes, they cool. take it with booze. <laughs> there we go. Well, it's a good thing that you're doing the craft beer thing. Um, so, so tell us some other best best practices you would see. Do do agencies get paid for their try? Oh, God bless your heart. So we never get paid for our try. Uh, so this is if we look at our budget, our budgeting from a business development standpoint over the year. You know, we're sinking tremendous amounts of hours, you know, and an RFP could cost you. And when I say cost you, I mean, theoretically cost you hours of the people who are being put towards the work. Yeah. 78, 100, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. When you get deeper on in a process and you're doing spec work, work that is, you know, specific to that client, specific to that strategy. You yeah, have not whole, been picked yet. Do the whole yet. campaign. Do the whole campaign, do the whole for, thing us for us. And, and you're into the finals. There's only two left. Do the campaign. Show it off. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of time. And you know there's only one winner. Tell me yep. how, how that plays out. And, well, you know, that's I, – I always jokingly say that that's one of the things I'm going to miss when my career is over, the, the, the juice of all of that. Um, but it really, you know, that is a, that's a tense period for everybody because, you know, it, the, the feeling of a vulnerability, I'm putting this thinking out there. I think it's really strong. I hope they've given me all the information I need to really resonate with who's making the decision. And then in a lot of cases, you're going out and you're contracting talent, you know, you're, you're, you're contracting voiceover, you're going out and you're, you know, using crews, you're paying for crews to do video production and things that are, you know, significant, meaningful and are, are actual out of dollar or excuse me, out of pocket expenses to you. Like that's it, it's a rush. Don't get me wrong. It is an it is a real adrenaline hit to be able to go through that process, especially when you get to the second round and you know you're just duking it out with some other phantom boxer. And do do you do you ever look at it and say, look, I know. Our agency is just in here as a stalking horse, and they're gonna, they're gonna, they're they're never gonna pick us. So we're gonna turn it down. We're gonna turn so down the RFP. Maybe in my in my advanced career now, I've gotten slightly more bullish on just saying what's on my mind, um, which is both good and bad. Um, but it, when we're a part of an RFP or we're included, especially in the initial phases of an RFP, where it feels like a funny fit. Yeah. Yeah. I will. I will actively now in every RFP that we do reach out and say, hey, 
you know, you don't have to answer this question. However, it would do both. It would be, you know, useful for both of us and the amount of time we're going to spend on this. Is this an open RFP? Does really anybody have the chance to win it? Or, it, you know, it, are there a couple of front runners because I'm going to spend a lot of money, I'm going to use a lot of time on it. And if you would give me that honesty, it would be appreciated. And will people actually give you that honesty or not? So the more senior a person you get to, the more likely the honesty is. The more junior a person, the more of an obfuscated answer you get. It's like, oh, no, 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 it's an open thing. Everybody's open got a shot. Open of deal. course. Everyone, you know, everyone's equal. Yeah. Who's making the decision? Oh, where it's collective. It's going to, you know, we're all making it. There's a scorecard and, you know, once, <laughs> you know, whoever there's wins. There's a scorecard yeah. that is never really going to be used, but yes. Yeah. Um, when in reality, there's a CMO like you who sits somewhere and they're like, yeah, they scored the highest, but I hated everything they did. So we're going with that. <laughs> yeah, that is not true, but <laughs> I appreciate you bringing up. Thank you so much. So tell us a great horror story that just will make our listeners understand what it's like to be on the other side of this process. Okay. So this one still, I still have post-traumatic stress from this one. When I walk into a certain ice cream parlor, if you can believe that. Okay. So this RFP actually happened when uh, we were the incumbent agency. We've been doing work with a very large uh, CPG group um, for a handful of years, by all accounts, the, uh, the, the work, the relationships, everything was in a very good spot. So on a Friday, uh, I get a, a an email from procurement from this organization uh, for a review. And it came to me as quite a surprise as the time it came, the fact that it came from procurement and that there was no heads up from the people in the business that we were doing work with. And so I, I made a phone call to the CMO and they're like, I ah, don't worry about it. This is, it's a formality. This is a uh, you know, this is this is not a big deal. You guys are doing a fantastic job. And, uh, you know, just go through the paces of it. But don't put too much effort, like don't go crazy on this. And I'm like, all right. All right. So, you know, we sp spent the week and we answered this review. Um, and which is an extraordinary. That's an F uh, or an RFQ or, 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 or an RFI or re request for information. Right. Um, you know, we're just it's a it's a prelim. Um, and so at this point, my wife and I, we have, our kids are both very young, probably two and one, and we're having ice cream at a local ice cream shop and I'm enjoying it. I'm having some vanilla ice cream I, in a waffle cone. I can picture it vividly. Uh, and then I uh, see an email pop up on my phone. Now, granted, this is one week after, and this is, this is multi seven figures worth of business to us. Yeah. And the email, uh, uh, just the subject line reads RFI response. And so I open it up because it's, you know, six o'clock on a Friday night. And it, in that email says, we regret to inform you, you've not been chosen for this. So I immediately go into a, 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 a thousand yard stare and cold sweated all over my body. Not, not least of which reason, knowing that this is a significant piece of revenue for the company and for myself. Right. And my, my wife looks at me and she's like, what, what happened? And I handed her my phone and I just remember, I know the window just staring out this window yeah. and absolute amazement as my ice cream. And I couldn't finish my ice cream and I love ice cream. And you could have gone and got the Rocky road because I'm certain after this, it was going to be a Rocky road with that client. Absolutely. So, so. now when I go to that ice cream shop, which still does happen, I have to sit with my back to that window that I was staring out of when I got that news. So wait, when you called up the company and said, what, the, what happened? What did they tell you? So the, uh, when you boil it down, uh, they said, you know, oh my God, I'm so sorry. It was a procurement driven RFP. Uh, you know, procurement chose to move on with, uh, you know, X, Y, Z pieces of this uh, based off of a criteria that you, you all weren't large enough to handle our multinational business. You know, we are we are very, you know, US, Canada, Mexico centered. When you get into the European Union or what was the European Union, Asia, we're just not big enough to really, you know, extend into those places. Um, and whether or not that was the actual information, what had what ended up happening is they ended up going with a uh, you know holding company, publicists and you know, a series of publicist agencies which makes all the sense in the world. And I, I can be completely fine with if that news is delivered, hey, the business has chosen that we need 
a unified global holding company in order to carry this torch. You're like, well, shit, man. Okay. I, you know, I, I can't, I can't deny that. And that's not what I am. Yeah. Instead it. it was, it ruined my vanilla ice cream. I'm sad. So tell us about, um, if you're giving CMOs or heads of, you know, agency relations in, in, you know, either B2B or B2C business, how, how do you, what, what one or two pieces of advice would you give them going forward? I, so the sharing internal audience research is such an unbelievably powerful thing for an agency. And sure, we're all under NDA during these processes, but I, I see it happen not as frequently as it should. We can't do our best work and we have unless we have all the information. It's one thing to say, hey, somebody's got craft beer experience here. They know the entire craft beer market, you know, in ubiquity. Um, sharing internal direction is just, it's paramount. Um, it, and then also being really prescriptive and having the honest internal conversations about what do we as an organization need to be pushed on? What are the things that are non-negotiables for us? And how can we articulate those to our agency partners in terms of what's going to get you through this process? Because ultimately, what I think a North Star is really useful in this is what is going to win this is bop, 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 bop. When a, a CMO in an organization can say they've had the honest conversations internally, we know what we need, we know where we're deficient, what is going to win this RFP is this before you start is such a benefit to everybody. Because then I think you get the best work. Because that's clarity also, of outcomes. That, that is really like, give us a clarity yes. of the game, give us clarity of the outcome, give us the rules. Like, yes. give us the rules and then stick to the rules. I, I hear yes. you. Okay. And because I think that's one of the things where we typically see these things go off kilter is we don't have a North Star and then communication during the process is flowery. It is we will communicate with you during this milestone to to announce whether or not you've made it through. That doesn't actually help get the organization the best work. You know, having the kind of open relationship in these RFP process where you can somebody can present to you and then you can pick up the phone after and be like, hey, you got that was a dud. What just happened? You'd be like, oh my God, you know, we thought about it. You know, our presenter had COVID and still tried <laughs> to, you know, get through it, blah, whatever the case is. But you know, that love, that open level of communication is if I'm being perfectly honest, is the most attractive thing for us. Because if we win the business, we're going to be married for a bit. Yeah. And I need to know that that's a part of the marriage versus getting blindsided by things that pop up out of out of nowhere that may, maybe could have been sorted out long ago if we just chatted about it. Got it. So you got all these marketers and advertising people, hopefully listening to this podcast. Yeah. What's one piece of practical advice we haven't talked about that you would give them? So this is this is a, this is a uh, something I, I will say that I've been learning lately, which is bring, especially now, bring the youth of the organization into the fray. Allow them to sit on the periphery and watch these processes happen. It's a real baptism by fire to get thrown into your first RFP. It's a real gift and a real learning experience for young people to be able to sit around and see the rigor and the stress management and the ability to say, you know, we're two days out, this isn't gonna work, we gotta go back to the drawing board um, to see the process of it. And then for, the, for agencies, I think there's a, there's a habit of discounting the feedback of the youth because it hasn't, it's not as battle tested. Yeah. And I learned something earlier this year during an RFP process that fortunately we won, where this just absolute nugget of genius for the audience, beautifully crafted, both visually and, and verbally, came out of somebody who is, I'm telling you, nine months into their career. 
and the the changing landscape of media and how people are coming out of their education in tune to it makes them actually kind of an insurance policy against the old heads. I will include myself in that doing what we've always done to be successful because the you know the 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 landscape is changing. Nice. Well, Jeff, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for our other shows, which include what your agency really wants to tell you but won't, why the short shelf life of CMOs, parts one and two, what is it really like in the B2B startup world, and is marketing's obsession with measurement destroying the function? Hey, all you marketers out there, stay safe. This is Mike Linton at CMO Confidential signing off, and thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Mike. Today's episode of CMO Confidential is brought to you by CMOcoaches.com. Are you a current or aspiring chief marketing officer looking to take your career to the next level? You should work with a CMO coach. CMO coaches are former CMOs who are nationally certified coaches. So whether you want to improve your leadership skills, develop your team, or drive better business results, we have the experience and expertise to help you succeed. To learn more, visit us at cmocoaches.com.